Hi, my name is Alex Williams, founder of the New Stack, and you're listening to the New Stack Analyst Podcast, a show about application development and management at scale. Thanks for joining us. The New Stack's pancake breakfast from Cloud Native Day is brought to you by Cisco. Check out Mantle, Cisco's open source microservices infrastructure, pulling together the best of open source projects, including Docker. Kubernetes and Ansible. Learn more at mantle.io. That's M A N T L.io. All right, well, good morning. It's early morning here in Toronto. And so thank you all for coming out for uh, another pancake breakfast. We're the new stack. My name's Alex Williams. I want to, first of all, uh, thank Cisco for sponsoring uh, the Pancake Breakfast and allowing us to, uh, which allows us to bring our Pancake Robot, which we have nicknamed Stacky, Stacky the Pancake Robot. And we've been really, you know, Ken, I've been saying we've been working really hard on this Mantle Pancake. <laughs> We're getting closer. <laughs> this is a definitely good. a project. We may, you know, we may even have to start our own, like, you know, GitHub project or something out of it, right? You know, we'll have to get some documentation out there and start having people commit and everything else. Um, but I, 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 I mean, I'm really interested in uh, this discussion today. Uh, in particular, oh my gosh, look at this. Thanks, Judy. <laughs> Judy, Judy Williams. <laughs> yeah. Woo! Woo! Um, yeah, so this is really an interesting time, I think, you know, from my perspective of covering the container ecosystem for the past you know, two plus years. And we've been discussing this over the past few days. And leading into this conference, there's been, you know, you know, there's been just such a flurry of activity. And I think it's what we're starting to see is it started with the container ecosystem thinking about containers and what is a container and what is that you know, and how is it used? And there was that kind of initial, you know, interest, and that just has like ballooned, as we well know. Um, we've we've now moved into this world of container orchestration, right? Where now we're like thinking about, well, how do you, um, you know, how do you actually manage these thousands of containers you might have, you know, in any one environment? Even tens of thousands. We're seeing, in some cases, hundreds of thousands, and even you know more than that. Um, so. This is a new architecture, right? But it, it, has, it has the effects on the developer as much as, the per, as people in operations. And now it seems like what we're moving into a new phase. And it, to me, it's representative of where almost like the, where we're starting to see uh, the need for a kind of a different thinking about how we develop software, right? Because, if, because I think the container ecosystem helps us think, well, gosh, you know, software really is at the center of business, right? You know, and and the software is increasingly open source. And so the developer is playing a key role, but it's not just a developer anymore. We have, we have foundations, we have member organizations. There's a lot of different forces here. And you know, the, the container ecosystem in particular has been showing both the strength of that, you know, of, of open source, but also its frailties, right? And how fragile it can actually be, right? When you have, uh, when you have different players who have really deep commercial interests in its future. And you have end users and customers who are just trying to figure this stuff out and how to use it. And so I, I wanted to, you know, to, to get this group together today to think about, think about open source. And we, we think of open source in terms of a, what is a space galaxy, right? We think of like, you know, like, like there's this great galaxy of open source, of, of open source projects out there. And to me, it's like, I, I, love, I love the space analogy anyway, it's, you know, just, just to talk about that. And, you know, it's like this, but we're starting to like see like, gosh, you know, are we prepared for this new future? And how are we gonna, you know, what have we learned to really, you know, help us propel ourselves? Because we need to have a lot of new people kind of into these communities, right? So that's kind of my preface here and, and kind of for the discussion today. And I would like to just start 
um, by ha having everyone introduce themselves, then we'll just get into the questions. So Chris? Good morning. Um, my name is Chris Wright. I'm Vice President and Chief Technologist at Red Hat, and I look forward to, to talking with you guys today on this panel. Hi, I'm Ken Owens at Cisco. I'm the CTO for Cloud Platforms. I'm Don Foster. I'm a PhD student at the University of Greenwich, and then I'm also an open source and community consultant at the Scale Factory. Um, I'm Shua Khan. Um, I'm uh, with the Samsung Open Source Group, and I'm a Linux maintainer, and I'm also on the Linux Foundation Technical Advisory Board. Hi, I'm Lee Calcote. I'm with uh, SolarWinds, uh, running a technology strategy. So, so Ken, I'm going to start with you and, and, and talk about, a little bit about the Mantle project. And tell us a little bit about the Mantle project. And, and can you tell us you know, how it fits in the container ecosystem? And what are some of your core principles for how you're managing it? Yeah, well, definitely. So I, I think the, the first thing you have to realize with the Mantle project is um, when you look at trying to deploy containers and the orchestration, it's, it's not too difficult to get containers and orchestration deployed. But to try to run and operate that at scale over a long period of time is a lot more complicated. You have um, things that fell within that ecosystem, and you don't have any notification or event that it fell. You just, something doesn't complete, so you need to kind of go and look at what fell. And um, some of the security controls around um, containers don't exist, right? So you have to sort of look at how do you secure this environment better. And then you have to start thinking about things like um, operational support and, and networking. How do, you, how do you, you know, give a name and an identity to a container so you can figure out that this container and this service, which is what the container represents as an application service, that this service has failed, and what's the impact if that service fails, right? And so, you know, when you're looking at these sort of problems, it becomes apparent that you need to kind of do more than just, you know, containers. You need more than just orchestration. You really need sort of this whole microservices architecture, which gets into how do developers develop their applications, how do they think about these sort of more complex operational problems and security problems and networking problems. And from my standpoint, I was like, this seems like a good project to create, pulling together all these different open source projects that exist to solve a lot of these problems because when there's a problem, there's a project to try to solve the problem, right? So, so instead of trying to reinvent the, the projects or reinvent the world, let's just use what projects are being used today by developers to solve these problems. And let's put all of that together into one project um, that helps maintain and support the open source community of, of projects around this. And that's what Mantle has become. So, you know, this is really an open question for anyone who wants to answer it. So, what are the frictions that come when you start developing these ecosystems? I mean, uh, you know, maybe Don, you could talk about it from like the community perspective. Like, um, what are some of the the, 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 the the real faults that you see when when new or, when new communities start to arise, or ones that you know do a good job at like reducing those frictions so the con contributions can be you know can flow and you can have a healthy community. Yeah, I think the, the biggest the biggest thing I'm seeing now that I think is different in this ecosystem is that the communities are a lot more integrated than they have been in the past. So it's, it's not just a developer community, it's not just a user community, and with the whole DevOps mindset, you have this mix mm -hmm. of developers in your community, system administrators in your community, um, who are often the, you know, taking the role of the user. So you have these communities that have a lot of different, um, different mindsets, different types of people in them, which I think on the one hand makes the community stronger because it's a little more diverse population, but on the other hand, creates friction because the things that developers want are not necessarily the things that the system administrators want. Right. And so you can end up, you can end up with some friction around that in, in the communities. Have you seen that? Um, a, a little bit, you know, uh, because developers and system administrators sometimes tend to think of things and, very differently. And the, and the system administrators are pretty new to this environment, aren't they? Um, I mean, not necessarily so, but there's a, there's a deeper mix as you, as in the you yeah. see a developer DevOps. I, I think it's just a I think it's just a deeper mix. I think historically they've maybe tended to be more in separate communities. Um, right. That's not entirely true, but I think is probably. The, I think the trend is now more that you see all of these people in the same communities, because with with containers you have the people who are you know writing the software in the container. You have the people who are developing the containers themselves in the open source projects, and then you have the system administrators who are actually using these things and 
trying to figure out if they can use them in production and make them secure and all the other stuff that goes around using containers. Right. So Shula, your experiences as a kernel developer, you've been a maintainer and you've you know, had to deal with you know, lots of different kinds of issues that arise inside communities. As a maintainer, like how, how would you deal with issues on a day-to-day -day basis so you don't have that long-term, So because you're always having to look in the short-term and the long-term because you want the community to be healthy and you, you want to in the short term be able to get just the work done, but you don't want to, you know, have like, a, you know, you don't want to have like, you know, it become almost like a political um, uh, game in many respects. And it's always, there's always politics involved. And, you know, I don't care because you know, we're all people, right? But, but, you know, there's ways that you can mitigate those issues. And I'm just curious from your perspective, how, what, what, what you've seen and how, like, for instance, like how, how have you had to deal with like, you know, rejecting um, a contribution, for example. Right. Like, you know. So, yes, you're right. There is a day-to-day -day thing, what goes into the next RC cycle or next week um, versus a long-term picture. One of the things that helps me anyway, the way I work is I focus on technical detail and say whether it makes sense for the project or makes sense for uh, the subsystem I'm maintaining. And then I also do active contributions as well, because so I work with other maintainers. Um, so the way I work is just focus on the technical details and use good communication and collaboration. That's the key to uh, getting to a good, and, and it all works out. Um, it, in, at least in the Linux kernel, we all focus on technical um, aspects a lot more than we are so at the bottom of the chain, if you will, the foundation. So we worry about that a lot. And so I think it sorts out communication. I would say collaboration is the key. And everybody coming in, you have to realize that they are trying to do the right thing for the project, what they think is the right thing. It's just coming to a common ground. No, I'd, I'd agree with um, Shua on that. And you know, just from a long-term perspective, the, the kernel isn't somewhere where you're going to want to make you know, short-term concessions. Um, but that, uh, you know, in terms of focusing on the technical, uh, I think part of what you're saying is that, that sort of, you know, the best technical solutions or technical merits can help avoid maybe some of those politics and it becomes um, more about what's the right direction for the project. You know, what's interesting in some of those, in the open source environments are, it becomes, it probably does, just the way that they're set up is not necessarily command and control that you might find in, a, in an enterprise or in a, a closed sourced project. And so uh, I think that that tends to lead naturally towards decisions more by influence and, and maybe based on their technical merit, um, particularly since most of those folks are, you know, are technical and or are writing in, the, in those projects. So, um, so hopefully, hopefully just by nature of an open source project, they're set up not to be necessarily politically influenced. Um, but, but OK. But now we're in the container ecosystem, Chris, right? And uh, um, there's, there's been increasing discussion I've heard about game theory, right? And how does game theory actually apply to the container ecosystem? And how does that, how does that, be, how does that play out kind of in the technical direction of these communities, right? I'm curious for your perspective on that. Well, so there's, oh, there's a lot going on here. We're, we're, the industry is exploding with, with innovation. Um, unlike a project like the kernel where you have, uh, you know, a reasonably well-established workflow and process and a singular notion of the project, we have an explosion of projects, many of which are overlapping. So yeah. in, in one portion of the game theory, it's, you know, maneuvering, posturing, figuring out how to, to position yourself to be the winner in the space that you're competing in. And in a project like Mantle, where you're assembling a set of projects, um, one of the frictions that comes up in this space is, are you picking winners? And we've had a lot of conversations about that in the CNCF specifically. I mean, is, is our role here to uh, identify the winning technologies or the winning specific projects? Or is our goal here to um, do something different and, and help the industry understand the problem domain? Um, maybe let evolution take over and the, the cream rise to the top. So, I, you know, I think one of the differences in this container space is, is 
you, you started your, your introduction with, you've been following it for the last two years-ish, approximately the entire lifespan of this movement. Right. So it's very young. Right. Uh, and it's, it's one of the exciting pieces about this space is it's easy to demonstrate the value of a container, especially right. to a developer. It's immediately obvious. Um, it also means because the, the focus for each, um, you know, like in, in a microservice context, you're really narrowing your focus. You've got a bounded context. You're trying to deliver fixed functionality in a, in a well-defined space, uh, which allows you to move more rapidly. It means you can quickly demonstrate progress, the flips, which, which is appealing to everybody. The flip side of that is when you go to that day two and you're going into operations, you're really starting to rely on production quality code that a flashy demo shows the concept, but it doesn't necessarily bake in the um, experience and just time it takes to really build a robust system. Mm -hmm. So we're in this interesting tension where we see the potential, we see where we want to go, we're, we're lured by, by the bright, shiny object, um, and, and we really, as an industry, need to kind of measure, meter our, our, our thinking about how, how are we going to adopt these things and actually make this work in production and in enterprises. Right. Ken, speaking to those, those tensions, and you know, Lee wrote an excellent chapter in our latest ebook on Docker and Container Ecosystem about all the different, for instance, you know, networking projects that are going on right now inside the Container Ecosystem, right? And I'm, you, know, you guys are you know, at your core a networking company, and we're talking about, you know, you know, he's talking about the tensions you know, as reflected in kind of what we're seeing in the community. And there's no, I mean, it, it's no secret that there's been a lot of debate about OCI, right? And the, the members in that group and the CNCF and the members in that group. And for anyone who's not familiar with it, maybe Ken, you can explain that a little bit. But what, I, I, you know, what do you see? What are some of the dangers that we're facing right now? I think the, um, so OCI is the open container initiative and it's it's kind of focusing on the, the container um, co components like the kernel the um, the, the file system the, the way you think about you know containers themselves and CNCF is is sort of a higher level foundation around you know how what is cloud native what does it mean to have um, some of these issues that we've, we've been talking about brought together um, not trying to pick winners but trying to figure out how do we help sort of clear out some of the FUD around containers and, and cloud native and how do we make it more of a, a community effort and not a bunch of individual small companies that want to try to be successful all on their own. And um, I think the biggest tension we see right now, especially in, um, in, this, in the e container ecosystem is to the point that, that you know, Chris made well, there's a lot of companies doing a lot of overlapping things. And in, in a lot of cases you can try to be a standalone company and maybe you know, become the kingdom maker, right? But um, thinking about galaxies, right, that's, that's not really the way the, the galaxies work, right? That's right. not really the way that the laws of nature are going to work when you're in this type of an environment. And so... Um, and if you try to fight it, that's when the forces of good and evil come into play. Right. That's my theory. <laughs> exactly. That's when, like, you know... You try to fight nature, you know, you're in trouble. Trying to fight nature, <laughs> then, you, then, you know, some dude in a big, you know, some big dude with a cape shows up and is like, I rule, man. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think trying to bring all of this together is really a, a top challenge. Um, and it, it kind of starts with how do you look at these projects as part of a larger ecosystem, right? And how do you create um, the ability for some companies to make a product and be successful, but also at the same time give customers choice so they're not locked in to any one technology or any one decision that they've made. And over time, like Chris said, I think there will be winners. There will be company, there will be technologies or choices or, or products that that do get adopted and do get chosen by by companies for whatever reason that they have for choosing products. It's, they, they've always had reasons right. to choose, right? Um, but I think in general, the overall ecosystem will be better because we're not going at it from a vendor-specific viewpoint. We're going at it from an industry ecosystem viewpoint, and we're we're taking into consideration that the whole industry is moving towards open source. And then open source is like the core of what every enterprise is trying to, to accomplish. Now, they need to be more agile. They need to, this whole transformation that's happening to be more of a software company has really been like, over the last few years, has really been at the top of every you know, CIO and, and business 
you know, person's mind. And so I think we're kind of seeing a, the accumulation of open source becoming critical to the enterprise, cloud native becoming the right development methodology or architecture to follow to kind of help you become more software and more agile. Mm -hmm. Those two things are kind of colliding together, so you get the supernova effect. The supernova <laughs> effect, I love it. And then um, the question is, what, what kind of good and evil forces are going to like? What are those good and evil break? forces? <laughs> what are they? Let's take a quick break for a message about our sponsor. The New Stacks Pancake Breakfast from Cloud Native Day is brought to you by Cisco. Check out Mantle, Cisco's open source microservices infrastructure, pulling together the best of open source projects, including Docker, Kubernetes, and Ansible. Learn more at Mantle. .io. That's M-A-N-T-L dot I-O. Now, let's get back to the show. I'm here with uh, my colleagues here at the New Stack. We have Ben Ball um, at the Pancake Robot. He's uh, managing Stacky right now. And Job uh, is here, a managing editor. And we have a question right here. One question? Yeah, we love it. Yeah, that's what I'm asking. Yeah. Hi. So I think that was very insightful, what you said, Chris, about um, Bright Shiny. And I think as a community, a lot of the times we value velocity over, say, a full operationalized type solution almost. I'm not going to say product because there's connotations there. We don't say product in open source, but there's a lot of things from productization that are valuable. So if we value velocity, I think that's a good thing in some ways. What do you guys think about um, things like OPNFV? And I'm not necessarily saying that we should adopt exactly that kind of thing. It's very ambitious. I think they started with a very ambitious goal and seeing some of the problems in trying to do that, but validating things. I know it's a trade-off between not wanting to be seen to be picking winners but at least giving the community the sense that, okay, there's more to this than PowerPoint and flashy, I've got a bright new shiny feature that I can turn on under special conditions with the wind behind my back, that's really something that can work with other things. What do you think about cloud native in some way adopting that kind of almost, we can validate that these things work together? Is that a, something you think might be in scope one day or? I mean, I can say definitively, it's been a, a, a very, central part of many of the conversations leading up to the creation of CNCF and, and subsequently. Um, if you don't know PNFV, it's a project that brings together a bunch of um, related work across a variety of, of open source projects to solve the network function virtualization problem domain for service providers. You, you could draw a really interesting analogy between that project and CNCF. In some ways, they, they have similar uh, concepts where you're pulling together a set of projects. So, in a, um, you know, a concrete counterexample to that would be something like, uh, like Node, uh, clearly focused on, on Node. CNCF or OPNFV are not necessarily the uh, authoritative source of a particular project. Uh, potentially, it's more about the combination of projects. And, and helping, I think, I think the critical piece here is that we're really trying to help the industry both understand what is the problem because we all have a, a sense, you know, there's pain, there's friction, we're trying what to What is the problem? Out. I think the problem that we're trying to solve here is how do you enable businesses to move more rapidly, respond quickly to business, demand, uh, business demands where the infrastructure that you're building historically has really been relatively static. And we're trying to move into a space where everything is, is dynamic and in constant flux. So Don, I'm curious, so, you know, from your perspective here, you know, Hold on. Okay, I'm sorry. Let me, Go let ahead. me finish the, the one thought, yeah, which sorry. is I think the, our responsibility here in CNCF is to, tr and, and similar in OCI, which is a f essentially a standardization project, it's to find, strike a balance between innovation, which is important, we're trying to move and change, and standardization and usability and, and, and longevity. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, OCI really draws out directly that tension because we're saying if you move too fast with no care for the user, you're constantly abandoning the user. And it's not, an, a, it's not a usable technology. And if you focus 100% on standardization, you're not moving the needle forward. So we're 
we haven't figured this out. You know, it's all new. We're, we're learning. To Chris's so, point, I think there's a there's you know a few themes that are um, similar between like Open NFV or uh, and um, CNCF and other type you know other foundations that are focused towards you know forward leaning um, technologies. And, and some of those, to, in my mind, are software defined and uh, developer defined uh, potentially. And so those themes of you know, flexibility and speed um, are really, it's programmatic interfaces um, through software defined that really help facilitate that. And it's, um, you know, that becomes sort of uh, to the forefront of the developer's mind and, and how they you know, write really probably more greenfield projects or new projects going forward and looking for those programmatic interfaces to, um, to, to get that velocity rate up. Ah, so, so since they're almost like automating the, the systems themselves. Yeah. To be more, uh, to be more fluid. So, Don, um, I was going to ask you about um, the education of the community, right? And and what are some approaches? I mean, because for example, you know, a fork, for example, can, can be perceived as a good thing or a bad thing, right? You know, and you don't want. You Depends if you're eating breakfast and pancakes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I eat my pancakes with a fork. You're right. <laughs> I don't know if anyone eats theirs with a spoon. I don't think I want to know who you are. Um, so I'm curious on like you know that aspect of it because there may be the need for a fork at some point, right? You know, uh, but now you have like now now again we're kind of in these new kind of dynamics where we have independent developers and you have systems administrators more deeply involved and you have corporations involved, right? And you may have one company that's dominate has a, the dominant you know kind of a technology for that group, but there's a much larger market out there that has an interest in it. And they, you know, and, and so there's competing forces there. Yeah, and tying back into the, the velocity comments earlier, I think that, you know, the fact that most of this infrastructure is open source um, makes a big difference when it comes to how fast you can um, innovate on things like that. So it's, it's a different mindset for a lot of companies in that they're not just creating it themselves and they completely control the project. They're responsible for you know, putting some of their people out into the project, like the Linux kernel has done this really well for years and years. But it's a different way of innovating, and it's a different way of doing development, because you, do, you, you can't control it. You have to put your people out there and influence you know, it as much as you can or should, depending on, depending on what it is you, that you're You got to be able to doing. just go with the community and its flow. Yeah. Yeah, and because of the corporate involvement, that, that makes it a little tricky, right? Because, you know, sometimes what, what I might want as, you know, a representative of a, a company might not be what the project needs. Right. And how do you explain that to your, your bosses, for right. example? Um, so I think it gets, it gets a little tricky from that standpoint. Um, and then, you know, getting back to your, your education comment, I think, um, you know, I think that depends entirely on the, on the project itself, you right. know, how you how you get people involved. There is, there is a certain amount of education that has to happen because you do want more and more people to get involved in the, in the project. How do they get involved in a way that is going to be productive? Mm -hmm. And how do you onboard new people in the way that they can you know, quickly get up to speed, they can do things that are going to be helpful for the project instead of maybe just what their boss told them to do? Mm -hmm. So I'm curious to show your perspective. Then I'd like to go back to you, know, to you guys and Lee can interject whenever you feel like it. But you work with Samsung, right? You know. How do you balance that relationship that you have in the open source community with your, you know, the corporate demands that you have at, at Samsung? Right. So um, it's uh, wearing two hats, right? I mean, you do you do what's best for the open source project. You always have to get the buy-in and consensus. Otherwise, your solution will not go in. So in in a large number of cases, you are looking at so this is what I want to do, and how I can do it in the open source. So it's a process of um, being flexible in terms of, you also have to look at what are the benefits to the community at large with this particular feature. Yes, you want to get this feature in because your product needs it, but you also want to look at how it can benefit. So that's where the flexibility, flexible points come in, and you have to work with that mindset that you do want to do, you want to achieve your goal, and how do you go about doing it? So it is, in some ways, 
tougher task than developing in closed source. Interesting. Or just strictly being in open source. Mm -hmm. so. I would, Joe, uh, does anyone have a question that they'd like to ask about, you know, a particular container ecosystem uh, or uh, open source overall, kind of the management in terms of business development? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're at Cloud Native Day, and uh, we're talking open source, but the number one cloud provider is Amazon, who seems pretty indifferent to open source on the whole, other than yeah. the fact that they use it. And there's a lot of other companies, uh, cloud companies, that open source parts of their stack, DigitalOcean, uh, uh, Salesforce, Azure, Google. Uh, so, I mean, in terms of open source and the actual cloud, is it like a new battle all over again? Or is open source just for the plumbing between the clouds? Or you know, what's going on with open source versus the cloud? I think um, it's interesting to take a look at um, which public cloud providers are doing open source and or you know, what, what their approach to it is. And talk about the 800 pound um, gorilla who um, does, does have maybe some open edge type things. Um, what do you mean? No, who, uh, who are you talking about? Maybe it's, hopefully that's not a, a who are you talking about? Uh, AWS. Okay. Um, and so, you know, just uh, at least uh, in the time that I've spent um, chatting with, with folks, um, you know, there's a you know, fair bit of that is kept um, in, in their four walls. Uh, there are some things um, like in and around the ECS team, the Elastic Container Services team has. Um, you know, in, in, as a user of that service, you take and run um, an agent within your environment, within your containers, and that agent is open. It's written in um, Go, and and open, you know, by and large, I believe, um, intentionally to to ensure that people are okay with how that's written and what it's doing. I don't know that anyone necessarily adores an agent. Um, there's always sort of the overhead question, and we'll hold on, what's what's happening, but. Um, and so I think they made that choice by and large to um, help facilitate adoption and, and a, a certain level of comfort with um, that particular service. Uh, anyway, I, I'm probably digress, but in general, so kind of interesting to come to look at how open source is being used maybe with that particular provider um, versus others. Uh, um, you know, interesting to see kind of the use of DCOS and kind of Mesos in and around um, Azure's, uh, you know, container services. And so obviously just kind of taking advantage of open source in, in that respect and, and building some, some capabilities around it. Um, so, so, you know, you know I, I don't know if there is a, um, a singular answer in terms of like, hey, you know, public clouds are built on open source versus not obviously. AWS is leveraging a lot of open source internally. Mm -hmm. um, but, AWS, but, but Ken and you and Chris, you guys can talk to this too. Like, I mean, AWS is really good at developing products, right? You know, and they, they, they come out with new products constantly, right? And, you know, when you're dealing in open source communities, you've got to, you know, take what you can from there and build out your own products, right? You know, but is, what is, is, is there a disadvantage that you guys face in that respect? Or is it an advantage that you have? You know, I mean, I'm sure you guys would think of it as an advantage, but the container ecosystem now is like, you know, dependent upon kind of this open, open framework, but you have the possibility that whole sections of it, you know, are potentially closed off. So, so far they're keeping most of the, for whatever reason, most of the container projects out there are open source projects. And so that, for whatever reason, this one kind of started off as an open community and it's staying open so far. I think, you know, in general, I think cloud technology is changing all the time, right? The, the, the first generation cloud and even some of the second generation clouds with OpenStack coming along are not, have not gone far enough to help businesses become more agile, right? Um, it's like they're just running your stuff in someone else's infrastructure and it's, it's still, you still have headaches, you have issues with trying to get access to logs and data that you wanna get access to. And so I think open source will change a lot in all the public clouds, including Amazon, and will be more externalized and more open for people to access and get data out over, the, over time. Um, containers will be part of that. That I think other parts will be um, some of the productization of solutions. You know, if you're consuming something as a service, you probably don't care if it's open or closed source, right? And so I think from that yeah, standpoint, right. You know, if you're developing a, a service and you want to just have you as a as an end user, I want to just consume that service. 
I may care, I may not care about the openness of that solution. And I think that's, that's where companies can, can make some money in that they've taken open source components, they build a product, they're selling that product, that product is usable and useful to consumers, and they're gonna buy that product. Um, and as we've seen with, you know, like my other, my other favorite um, 10,000 pound gorilla, the, you know, um, Apple, right? People will pay more for something for that experience even though they don't really have to, right? But they still will because it's, they like that product and that brand. And so if you can, if you can get to that point, like AWS has, you should definitely take advantage of that because that's, that's the kind of you know, universe we live in. It's, it's good for, for free trade, so. We just, have a, we just have about a minute and a half left, so Chris, any last thoughts? And well, in, in this particular space, it's undeniable that all of the clouds are built from open source. So that's, I don't think that's the question. The question is, about the particular services. And there, you know, you, you, it's, it's sort of an, in, uh, maybe it's a race or whatever, but it's, it's about how can you be focused and deliver something that's valuable to, to an end user. Right. And as you find an open source project that gains traction, momentum, and interest to the users, you'll see cloud providers enabling that specific technology in their cloud. And if there isn't a competitor in the open source space that users are looking for, and they have created one for, I mean, Amazon has a, a, a very large head start. Um, then you, know, you build your own. And, and I, you'll, I'm, I'm confident you'll see things that exist today that will transition to an open source project tomorrow just based on, on user demand. And so maybe it's that ability to be laser focused when you completely own direction uh, that can produce something that's valuable to a user very quickly. But longevity, uh, you know, the, the entire industry behind something is something you just can't ever compete with, certainly in the long term. So maybe it's a question of short term, long term. Well, this has been a good introductory conversation, so thank you guys a lot for participating. I want to thank Cisco uh, for sponsoring the Pancake Breakfast. Thanks, Ken, and, Man and Mantle in particular. You should check it out. And uh, we'll see what happens today at Cloud Native Day. Thank you guys for participating. Thanks. The New Stacks Pancake Breakfast from Cloud Native Day is brought to you by Cisco. Check out Mantle. Cisco's open source microservices infrastructure, pulling together the best of open source projects, including Docker, Kubernetes, and Ansible. Learn more at mantle.io. That's M-A-N-T-L.io.